and welcome to New World Order. Game of Thrones is back. I always think it's crazy that that show is filmed in Northern Ireland. Incest and dragons, you'd think it'd be Wales. <laughs> <laughs> Theresa May went on a walking holiday in Wales with two security guards. I assume they were there as a kind of suicide watch. <laughs> I mean, she's probably just looking for a cliff to jump off at this stage. That's why she walks all kind of hunched over. She's trying to keep her trousers up now that they've taken her belt off her. <laughs> just eating every mushroom that she finds, not caring, right? Hallucinating about her deal going through. She'll bring that deal back, just watch her. Oh, look, I've changed the font. I've added some clip art of a dog. We had Extinction Rebellion, and good for them, good for Extinction Rebellion. What else are you going to do with climate change? Adapt to it? Oh, who can forget the wonderful summer of 2035? It was 11 and a half months long, and your mother and I rode across the Cotswolds on a camel. <laughs> I don't know if Emma Thompson was the best celebrity to have at the protest, though. Maybe it should have been someone more relatable, like Ray Winston. It's five to one on, we're all going to be up to our tits in fucking seawater. <laughs> what are you, some kind of climate nonce? <laughs> I don't know that our political leaders are the best people to deal with climate change either, because they're all so old. They're not going to be around to see the end of the world. Vince Cable will be lucky if he sees the end of Line of Duty. <laughs> And how am I supposed to do jokes about Jeremy Corbyn? Last time I saw Jeremy Corbyn was about a week ago. He did a photo opportunity where he was sat in a canoe on dry land. <laughs> Excuse me, would you mind getting into this metaphor? <laughs> I think the Labour Party must have loved Easter, though, because really it's a story about their key values. It's a story about compassion and self-sacrifice. And at its heart, it's a story about social justice. And a Jew dies. <laughs> They're going to fucking enjoy that. <laughs> Greta Thunberg is in Britain. Apparently she's going to meet Michael Gove. I think it'd be good if she meets Michael Gove and then decides that the earth isn't worth saving. <laughs> Prince Harry, apparently, and Meghan are thinking about moving to Botswana. It's a logical choice for Harry, isn't it? A guy who could get skin cancer from a fucking holiday brochure. <laughs> a guy who'd burst into flames under a crescent moon. <laughs> Shamima Begum, she's getting a lot of hate because she's getting legal aid. Why shouldn't she get legal aid? Where's her compassion going? as a country. Surely the compassionate thing to do would be to bring her back and make her finish school. <laughs> yeah, this essay about what you did in your holidays. Uh... <laughs> She's actually become a hate figure. I think it's embarrassing for us as a nation. I think if they brought her back and gave her a boob job on the NHS, this country would actually explode. <laughs> OK, let's get on with the show. Joining me tonight to discuss the week's big topics are Sarah Pascoe, Miles Jupp and Rob Delaney! <laughs> Hello. Hello. You had a good week? Yeah. Yeah. I'm talking for everyone. Have you been in America? <laughs> yeah. I think what I wanted to say is uh, I've been out all day and didn't have time to go home and change, so I just bought this shirt and I, I don't smell good. <laughs> you look good. What about you, Miles? What have you been up to? Uh, my life continues to be a succession of erotic adventures. <laughs> what kind of stuff? I'm not going to give examples, but if you imagine it, probably right. <laughs> First up, Donald Trump is a human being who just wants to be loved by his daughter. <laughs> you have to hand it to America. When they said it's the country where anybody can be president, they really did mean anybody. <laughs> Even Donald Trump, a man who looks like something you'd pick off a baking tray after cooking pizza above it. <laughs> With a body like some hemorrhoids that God twisted into a balloon animal, 
and a head like someone drew a face on a plum and lost it for a month. <laughs> Trump... <laughs> Trump becoming president was like someone winning MasterChef by filling a pot noodle from the hot tap. <laughs> He looks down on people, perhaps because if he looked up, his hair would flip down like an easy jet table tray. And yet, I really don't think I could watch if Trump was assassinated, because I'd be coming so hard that my glasses would fall off. <laughs> Joining us to discuss Trump, please welcome comedian Sarah Barron. <laughs> Welcome aboard, Sarah. Thanks, that was disgusting. <laughs> You're an American. Indeed I am, although like Rob, I live here, and I have done for six years, which I always feel the need to warn people about, because I think they hear an American accent, and you get worried that I'll talk about, like, shit is awesome, and I feel the need to assure you that over the course of the years, these fuckers have exfoliated the positivity off me. <laughs> so I'm miserable too, guys. <laughs> And how do you think it's, it's all going to go with this state visit and Trump and all that stuff? I think it's going to, like, everything is just terrible all the time. And then the question is only ever, what is terrible right now? Mm -hmm. And what is terrible right now is the Mueller report, because we thought it was going to get him, <laughs> and it didn't. But it didn't exonerate him either. He's talking like it exonerated him, but that's only because he didn't read it. <laughs> it's 400 pages. The longest thing Trump has ever read is a tweet. <laughs> Like, the worst day of his life is when Twitter doubled its character count. <laughs> what, what do you think about all that Miller Report stuff, man? You, did you have any hope for that? I really didn't. You know, they were releasing indictments as it went along, so I, I think he might have kind of shot his wad too early. I mean, if all that had happened in one day, all the arrests, then it would have had a more dramatic effect. So I figured the Mueller Report would be a damp squib, and it's, unfortunately, I was right. <laughs> Miles, are you looking forward to his uh, state visit? The thought of Theresa May receiving him at some sort of official function. So you've got a woman who, who hates talking and has nothing to say. She likes to dance. She likes to dance. <laughs> he will talk shit while she dances. He will not talk to a woman that old. He has no interest in spending any time with her at work or socially. I think Theresa May is hoping that someone tries to assassinate him so she can dive in front of the bullets. <laughs> <laughs> In America, the gap between rich and poor has never been wider. Incredibly, the three richest Americans are wealthier than the entire bottom half of society. But in Fox News, the idea of raising taxation on the very rich is met with utter incredulity, as we can see in this slick and troubling clip. And there is an, a scene, what seems to be a movement against capitalism in this country. We pulled up this latest Fox News poll on the issue, whether Americans support raising taxes on the wealthy, on incomes over 10 million bucks. Uh, those that are in favor of that, 70 percent, Charles, over a million dollars in income, 65 percent are in favor of raising taxes. The idea of fairness has been promoted in our schools for a long time. Uh, and, and, and now they're becoming voting age, and they're bringing this uh, ideology with them. <laughs> they're mad at their own poll. They're like, look at this Fox News poll that we just, <laughs> that we just paid for and did, and we're showing it to you. Take a look at it. <laughs> and this is also Fox News. So these are people who we know <laughs> think fairness in schools is more dangerous than guns in schools. <laughs> Can I say quickly that a lot of these rich people pretend to not understand marginal tax rates either. It's like 70% on every dollar above 10 million that you make each year. Right. So it's yeah. like, don't give me this feigned ignorance. You, you just don't want to pay anything. Just say that. And that's the best thing about 2019. You can say whatever you want. You can just be like, all black people should be in jail and I shouldn't pay any taxes because I don't have any melanin. Just say that. <laughs> You can say that now. You know that's going to be the trailer for the show now. <laughs> and not just this episode. <laughs> It's also there's so much of the American optimism on display here because the, the point at which people don't want to tax the rich mm -hmm. is 250,000 
annually, right? So I think something like 5% of American families earn that. Mm -hmm. That means there's 95% of American families that think that maybe they could get there. Yeah. And that kind of optimism doesn't exist yeah. over here. Which, which is I why love. I prefer, <laughs> that's why I prefer it over here. Because these people get happy if they get like one bank holiday yeah. a year where it's sunny enough to swim in the sea, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> shit happens, it's front page news. Really, truly, because yeah. here, people are like, why would a good thing happen to me? <laughs> <laughs> but don't be, don't despair, because when something does happen once in a while that's good, you're really happy. Whereas in America, you're like, mm, I deserved it. But we're here, you're like, thank you. The people in Trump's inner circle still don't seem to realize how much of a laughing stock he is on the world stage. Here's awkward footage of the vice president, Mike Pence, painfully misjudging Trump's reputation at a conference in Germany. Who has worked with these members of Congress to strengthen America's military might and to strengthen the leadership of the free world. I bring greetings from the 45th president of the United States of America, President Donald Trump. Last August. <laughs> to be fair, he might have just been waiting for booing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and certainly, it, it could well not be an applause break. It could be the fact that every time he says Trump and President in the same sentence, he always has to literally stop and gather himself, thinking, <laughs> Christ, it's actually real, isn't it? <laughs> no matter how much the fake news media hates Donald Trump, he'll always have a friend in Fox News. Here's a glib Sean Hannity ripping clumsily into Trump's longtime rival, Bernie Sanders. Senator Bernie Sanders kicked off his 2020 campaign in Brooklyn, wasted little time before revealing, well, more hypocrisy. Democratic Socialist, open borders advocate, held a rally and was happy to greet his supporters from behind a barrier. Why is the fence up, Bernie? Oh, a barrier is acceptable if they protect you personally? They're only wrong if they're used to protect our border and the American people? <laughs> I think that might be the stupidest point anyone's ever that's made. Like, that's like bulletproof proof that all Bernie's policy proposals that day were amazing. So all he could say was like, there was a fence. <laughs> and at his house, there's walls. What? <laughs> Last month, the Democrat politician Mobita Johnson Harrell became the first Muslim woman elected to serve in the Pennsylvania House of Representatives. Not everyone felt happy about this, with fellow state rep Stephanie Borowitz giving an impassioned prayer ahead of the swearing in, which left many looking uncomfortable. Representative Borowitz. Thank you, Speaker. Let's pray. Jesus, I thank you for this privilege, Lord, of letting me pray, God, that I, Jesus, am your ambassador here today, standing here representing you, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the great I am, the one who's coming back again, the one who came died and rose again on the third day. Jesus, we've lost sight of you. We've forgotten you, God, in our country. And we're asking you to forgive us, Jesus. Thank you that Jesus, that we're blessed because we stand by Israel and we ask for the peace of Jerusalem as your word says, God. Name of Jesus, the one who, at, at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess, Jesus, that you are Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> <laughs> she, she looks like she's been asked, can you just fill till the band's ready? <laughs> if only there was some kind of word you could use to finish a prayer. <laughs> And the facial expression of the speaker on the left of the screen, mm. it's like the look on every wedding guest's face mm. every time a drunk best man starts yeah, being but, like, mm. listen, I just want to say, like, John and I, we used to get so drunk at college. There was this one time we hired Brett, and everyone's like... <laughs> <laughs> Dave made me promise I wouldn't mention what we did together in Brighton, but I have to tell you, you're going to love it. <laughs> Along with golf, money, beef, money and golf, President Trump's other great obsession is his daughter Ivanka. Always close by his side, Ivanka has been brought up to understand the difficulties that come with being part of the 1%, as seen in this enlightening clip. Well, I remember once my father and I were walking down Fifth Avenue and there was a homeless person sitting, um, sitting right outside of Trump Tower. And I think I was probably maybe nine, nine, ten, something like this. It was around the same time as the divorce. And I remember my father pointing to him and saying, you know, that guy has eight billion dollars more than me because he was in such extreme debt at that point, you know? And, um, and me thinking, what are you, you know, what are you talking about? He's, he was sitting outside of Trump Tower and I'm looking and I'm going, 
You know, and I didn't understand. I like the detail that, so this is during the divorce, she says, which sort of paints a very interesting picture of like a weekend dad Trump, like a mm. Saturday is dadder day kind of guy. <laughs> so he's not taking her for ice cream, not going to the zoo. He's like pointing at homeless people as a way of contextualizing himself as a victim. Yeah, and well, that's what she, at the end she goes, and I didn't understand. It's like, that wasn't your age. That's because your father is a psychopath. <laughs> right, not the process. Yeah. Like she seems to be telling it as a, a positive yeah. story. Like I don't feel bad for Ivanka Trump, but you are watching that going, you're trying to summon up for whoever this interviewer is, like a, yeah. a sweet memory of you and your dad, and yeah. this is what you could yeah. come yeah, up with. Yeah, I remember yeah. that afternoon, dad walked around comparing himself to tramps. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Like, a lot of people would have thought of that man as a human being worthy of yeah. help or compassion, but my father knew that he was a teachable moment. <laughs> <laughs> she couldn't choose her father, but she chose Jared as her oh. husband. Mm. And I mean, he, he looks like every room of his house is just covered in tarpaulin in case he decides to kill someone. <laughs> That's enough about Trump. Thanks to Sarah Barron. <laughs> Next up, like every other panel show, let's discuss Guy Debord's theory of the spectacle. <laughs> so the idea of the spectacle is that we're all trapped specifically in capitalism in the advertised life. So when I, I first got into comedy, I thought the worst thing you could do would be to do an advert, right? But now I think, well, you're trapped in the advertised life anyway. What you should do is do an advert and then just give the money to charity. That's all you can achieve. I get asked to do an advert once for Scottish Blend. You know, the tea people, I, I wish I'd just taken the money and given it to charity. Admittedly, I don't know what that advert would have been like. People who drink Tetley fuck kids. <laughs> The spectacle, said the French Marxist Guy Debord, has replaced normal human relations with the alienation of commodity fetishism, a system of domination that demands your attention, and then your attention achieves your subjugation. And of course, here's the irony. There's not a single thing I can say to you from within the spectacle that won't simply make it stronger. The spectacle, said the French Marxist Guy Debord, is the bad dream of a modern society in chains. And then, in 1994, he shot himself in the heart the stupid cunt. <laughs> Joining us to discuss the spectacle, please welcome comedian Sophie Duca. <laughs> hey Sophie. Hello. Are you familiar with Guy Debord's concept of the oh, spectacle? Oh, aren't we all? <laughs> <laughs> the thing about it is that it's everywhere, like it's in uh, social media, adverts, propaganda, news, we just have to like accept it because it's like a part of reality that has become abstracted and then it's consumed us, like as thoroughly as Diane Abbott consumed that mojito. <laughs> I think it's like in the 60s when you were Guy Debord, you could be a philosopher, you could think critically about it, but yeah. now, like, we're so immersed in the spectacle, being a philosopher just means you've seen the Matrix. <laughs> <laughs> what do you feel, Miles? Do you feel you're trapped within the spectacle? Uh, continually, yes. Um, I think at the moment people just sort of lie all the time. Things like Twitter, people think of a version of themselves and they just contribute to, sort of, to the spectacle in that sense. The sort of idea of this sort of a corporate consumer thing, that individuals are now sort of such a strong part of it that people individually are creating their own spectacles that feed into it and just sort of sitting around thinking, what do I want people to think that I'm like? What do I want people to think I believe? What do I want them to think they're interested in? And they can just do that at the touch of a a few buttons. That's why I'm going to go and live in the woods. <laughs> you often say this. This time I mean it, Frankie. <laughs> I don't think people should have this kind of conversation if they're not stoned. <laughs> you, you should have come to the green room earlier. <laughs> I think We're absolutely I... boxed out of our fucking minds. <laughs> I, I think human beings have always had the same base wants, which are hierarchical, that involve having slightly more than other people. I don't think anyone is trying to puppet master and control people's minds or distract them. People like watching bright, shiny things. 
I think the spectacle exists, and it's the kind of a thing that can just get set in motion, and then we all kind of play our part in it. I think if you look at like late stage capitalism where we are now, and you have income equality that is just so insane, the sort of good news about the spectacle is, is that things are so untenably awful for so many billions of poor people that if the spectacle exists, which I think it does, it will all come crumbling down. Um, in the, and it'll be pretty bloody. <laughs> <laughs> but I think if this was termites, mm -hmm. and they were all trying to build a bigger and bigger and, and eventually it collapsed on them, mm -hmm. that's not sad, it's just something that happened. Mm -hmm. That's all we're sad. doing. Okay. It's not sad. It's not the thug's life. No, it's, <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it was it's, sad. It's sad because we as apes have empathy for things and think that mm -hmm. life matters, but it mm -hmm. doesn't. No, In the long right. scheme of things, it doesn't. We don't care. Mm -hmm. We care about having more money. Mm -hmm. We care about having more stuff. And that's why you call it the spectacle, but it's not. It's just ape behaviour. I like that you've come up with something more depressing. Than this, guy. <laughs> <laughs> this guy shot himself in the heart. <laughs> Shoot. <laughs> Modern consumer society is utterly permeated by advertising. Giant faceless corporations will use advertising to present themselves as small, friendly and unthreatening. As we can see in this bizarre yet surprisingly sophisticated ad from Barclays. When we started selling healing crystals and storing them in a barn, nobody took us seriously. Then our business really started to grow. And that's why we switched to taking payments with Barclay Card. Now we have four barns worth of crystals. Come, let us tell you about our crystals. This angel aura quartz is believed to stimulate the highest vibration of the third eye. Just drive along Northfield Avenue and turn onto the A6003 <laughs> and when you reach the A69... This charming amethyst crystal is believed to be a talisman for the creative arts. Until you reach Stamford Road. Turn down there. So if you're serious about your business and want it to grow, Search Barclay Card Business today. Goodbye. Crystals. <laughs> barns is not a great way to, to kind of uh, suggest that something is valuable, is it? We've got four barns of this shit. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a skip full of this magical crystal. <laughs> Barclaycard is like over a trillion pounds in assets, right? Mm. They've got so much money, and in order to be kooky, they're exploiting this penniless guy who believes he's a wizard. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't get the grades to go to Hogwarts, so he just sells placebos to muggles. It's so <laughs> mean. But like the most magical thing in that advert is the card reader. <laughs> but I suppose we're showing it because it's kind of the spectacle in miniature, isn't mm. it? So they create this thing that makes these people look foolish. Um, but Barclays are trying to profit from them at the same time, so they're pitching it in a way to go nudge, nudge, wink, wink, look at these people. They're ridiculous. At the same time, we take every business seriously. Yeah. But I've never wanted anything more to be a sex cult because it would be, like, more, like happy. I want her to, like, dazzle you with the crystals while he puts a sack over your head. <laughs> Maybe she's got one of those... What is it What they do in Essex when they put the... On your foo -foo? Oh, the vajazzle. Vajazzle, but with proper oh, crystals. With proper crystals. <laughs> so it's, like, spiritual as well. Yeah, where do you want your third eye, love? <laughs> what? <laughs> With the rise of social media, the spectacle has taken on a new and terrifying form, a sick panopticon prison, which we, the prisoners, are forced forever to build and rebuild. A monstrous, unsatisfiable maw into which we toss our pathetic lives. People are driven insane by its demands. Instagram influencer Marcella Zoya was recently charged with endangering lives in Toronto after her bizarre and reckless phone footage came to light as reported on local news. How your mind is feeling, and it's right here. Oh, wow. She's embarrassed. Um, she's never had to do, go through anything like this. She had do you to turn herself in this morning. Do you want to just stop here and you can stand next to him and he'll right we'll, speak for you? Right um, so, yes, you were saying it was a, a traumatic experience? Yeah. She's, uh, you guys have put her under a great deal of scrutiny, oh, wow. put her under a microscope for the last three days. Uh, it's been embarrassing for her, for her family, and uh, she has to deal with that. Why well, did she do it though? Why? So, uh, just above your head. Can you yep. explain that, no, Marcella? No, she has no comments on that. It's a case like any other case. There's a presumption of innocence. I know that they have a great, uh, strong case with the video, but there's going to be ongoing discussions between myself and the Crown, and we'll deal with it as a recourse. See, that to me is the spectacle. She's just been gripped by a force she doesn't understand to participate. Ah! <laughs> and suddenly she's. Instagram famous. 
she's just a dickhead. <laughs> and everyone who watches it is a dickhead. And I hate her face. There you go. I've said it. I think she must be really thick, because I imagine, like, her friend was just filming her and just went, oh, hey, do something crazy. And she threw the chair, and the friend was like, not like that, like jazz hands. <laughs> Because you see, she throws the chair, you're like, oh, this is going to be bad. And then you're like, oh, my God, how many people are going to die? Yeah, and, and then, then still had time to write good morning. There's <laughs> <laughs> a little caption underneath it. That chair actually became a celebrity and has replaced Alex Zane as the host of RidTube Maximum Lols. <laughs> Well, that's the end of the show. Thanks to my guests, Sarah Pascoe, Miles Jupp, Rob Delaney, Sarah Barron and Sophie Duker! <laughs> But before I go, I'd like to leave you with this thought. A lot of Britain's problems seem to stem from its complete inability to face up to the loss of empire. There are only 14 overseas territories remaining, one of them being Pitcairn Island, home to only 50 people. Sounds like paradise, until you discover that in 2004, seven men, a third of the male population, were convicted of underage sex crimes. You can understand why the British elite are so keen to hold on to this beauty. <laughs> the third of the men being sex criminals creates a sense of nostalgia, reminding our establishment of prep school, university, Westminster, and any time they're in a car with two other people. <laughs> there are those who ask whether the class system is still relevant in the United Kingdom, and perhaps the word kingdom gives us some kind of clue. <laughs> In Victorian times, the rule of thumb for wealthy families was that the oldest son would run the estate in Britain and the second son would travel to the colonies to find their fortune. Looked at that way, it's easy to see imperial excess as nothing more than the symptoms of second child syndrome. When Hugo hears that his brother back home has got the orangery up and running, it is in many ways a natural response to systematically starve 20 million people. <laughs> and in a way, this has happened in modern times too. The members of our elites who used to go into politics now choose real power by going into the finance sector. And we are left with people like Michael Gove. <laughs> Michael Gove, who looks like a witch tried to turn a schoolboy into a snail and forgot the words halfway through. <laughs> Michael Gove, a man who is leaving his body to science fiction. <laughs> Michael Gove, who looks like what remains after the third horse of the apocalypse snags its cock on a fence. <laughs> Michael Gove is human, certainly, but he is not how we like to think of ourselves. There are no movies where the hero is like Michael Gove. Indeed, even the villains are often more relatable. In fact, the only echo of Michael Gove in the whole of the Western canon would be an occasional character in a cautionary fable for children. A shepherd boy who spreads rumours about the foreign ways of the people from the next village, only to find they are reluctant to help him when he is carried off by a paedophile. <laughs> There have been reports recently of a drug that can halt dementia in mice. Good news for people with dementia, bad news for mice. Surely the last thing you want when you've been used in a drug experiment and will eventually be thrown into a bin is clarity. <laughs> and maybe we should ask ourselves whether, with our own immediate political future, we really want clarity either. Good night.